All right, so Yellow Jackets Season 2 has kicked off, winter has come, and flesh is finally on the menu. I was personally mystified by Season 1's roller coaster of supernatural twists and turns, and I am hungry for more. So in this video, we're going to be breaking this thing down, the latest episode of Season 2, things you might have missed, some callbacks, and potential theories to explain some of these weird symbols and events that are happening. Now this recap is going to be heavy on the spoilers, so if you haven't kicked off Season 2 yet, then get out of here. If you enjoy this video though, hit that like button as it's much appreciated, and subscribe to join the beehive of spoilers, as we'll be covering this weekly. With all of that out of the way, thank you for clicking this. I'm your host, Jared. Now let's get into Yellow Jackets. Now season two kicks off roughly two months after Jackie was turned into a human popsicle and left Shauna and the others completely devastated in the wilderness as winter was upon them. Here we get snippets of the cabin living arrangements and daily routine, with Sharon Von Eaton's 17 being the backtrack to all of this. Several of the girls are camped out downstairs to stay warm by the fire, while Thaisa and Van appear to have their relationship continuing. Their wrists are tied together with some rope, which we later find out is Van's remedy for Thaisa's sleepwalking, climbing, and dirt-eating instances. Coach Scott is full-on lumberjack beard mode, and Shauna is sleeping next to an empty bunk that we can assume is Jackie's. It looks like everyone has sort of adapted a routine as Travis and Natalie gear up for their morning hunt, insulating their socks and jackets with the nudie magazines that they found in the cabin during season one. Lottie, leaning into her supernatural rituals, sends them on their way, but not before rubbing ashes on their palms, blessing them with some makeshift incense, and drinking some herbal tea with a drop of Lottie's blood in it. Obviously, after Lottie's baptism from Laura Lee, she has slowly become more and more religious in her beliefs, and these same practices are usually done in churches, for example, Ashes for Catholic Ash Wednesday. I love Natalie's skepticism of Lottie, calling it Wicca bullshit, essentially the modern interpretation of pagan worship and witchcraft, but Lottie rebuttals with the age-old fear tactic. Well, you keep coming back alive, don't you? which is utilized by several religions and groups. We see her draw the same mysterious cryptic symbol we've seen time and time again in season one. Obviously, Lottie is adapting this more and more, but its true meaning has honestly yet to be revealed. I mean, some theories out there suggest it's an upside-down person hanging from a hook and about to bleed out, but again, only a theory. Flash forward to 1998 as the surviving girls appear to board a plane and fly back to New Jersey wearing search and rescue sweatshirts. The scene is honestly crafted really well because we don't actually get to see who made it out alive and who didn't. I mean, aside from the four women from season one, and I'm assuming Lottie, it looks like Van may have survived too with one of the girls having red hair. Now, subtle clues as to what happened with their flight also are revealed with one reporter stating that the crash site was roughly 600 miles north of the anticipated flight path. Nationals were supposed to be in Seattle, which is where they're at according to the patches on the police officers' uniforms. So 600 miles north of a New Jersey to Seattle flight path puts them well over the Canadian border, which explains why no one found them. Lottie is put through electroshock therapy by her parents. This is done because of her wilderness PTSD, while her father never believed in her, quote, psychic abilities. So I think from his point of view, this is much needed procedure. During this though, Lottie has the same visions from her baptism, but appear to be fading. The candle is slowly extinguishing, meaning maybe Lottie is losing faith in what Laura Lee had preached to her. As it then flashes to present day, and yes, Lottie is very much alive, and just like the final episode of season one hinted at, it appears she is running a cult like straight up Scientology and Nexium style, as she preaches about bettering themselves, and the perfect vision of you is out there. One line, though, stood out to me. Because it isn't real. It isn't real. Part of me thinks Lottie just compartmentalized the wilderness, and it's not real to her. Anyway, the coloring of the clothing gives us a bit of an insight into where Lottie stands in comparison to her followers. First, they are all wearing light pastel purple, invoking spirituality and imagination. 
This is also what the gang was wearing when they kidnapped Natalie, so suspicions are correct, Lottie was behind it. While Lottie is wearing an orange or burnt sienna for anyone who could afford those 64 crayon sets as a child. Now, orange typically provides warmth and emotional support as she is supporting her followers. Finally, the standard Yellow Jackets intro kicks in. However, this is updated with new footage from season two. These are quick shots, but may give us a clue as to what to expect in this season. We see who looks like Coach Scott putting on a facial mask, probably some much needed backstory on his character. A close up of the pendants Lottie's followers are wearing and her preaching. A note with I am grateful for my friends written on it, followed by someone burning this, maybe betrayal during this or after the wilderness. A low angle shot of 10 girls as opposed to only 4 in the season 1 intro, so maybe season 2 is focusing on much more of the yellow jackets. A shot of an older van, so we know that she's gotten out of there at some point. What looks like a Captain America Civil War Twilight Breaking Dawn showdown with half of the girls having weapons, getting ready for some cat fights, baby! And of course, No Eyes Man from season 1 again makes an appearance. Who or what are you? I hope we find out. It looks like present day picks up right where we left off with Misty trying to train Shauna how to dupe the police if they ever question her about Adam's disappearance. I'm sorry, but Misty, it, it, Misty is f***ing weird, but the I want my lawyer cookie cake was great. Even though the women went through all of this together in the last season, it didn't necessarily ignite their friendship, as Tasia and Natalie are over an hour late for Misty's murder masterclass. Shauna reassures her everything is going to be fine, while Misty thinks they might have missed something. Misty's been trying to contact Natalie almost every hour on the hour without any answer, so she checks out her trusty citizen detective subreddit for tips. There are a lot of small details tucked away here, first Misty's username being African Grey, tying back to her bird Caligula, which is also likely named after the Roman Emperor, who was a bit off of his rocker. If so, this is some subtle character development on Misty if you didn't know. But a couple of topics being discussed tie back to season one events. The Parsippany Poisoner, what are the cops missing, is most likely referring to Misty poisoning Jessica at the end of season one. Because Parsippany is a township located in New Jersey, and that's where this uh, series takes place. Boom! Gotcha! And of course, the missing artist in Hoboken is referring to Adam. Now, part of me is keeping tabs on these other topics like the UFO and missing travelers because they're bound to come back up. Or maybe, maybe I'm just sipping too much of Lottie's tea. Anyway, Misty was right about them missing something. A fellow citizen detective discovers Adam's credit card statement, and it all but confirms that he had a secret lady friend in his life, that being Shauna. <laughs> Downvote, but you, on the other hand, can like and subscribe to keep up to date on all of the Yellow Jacket spoilers, as we're going to be covering all of this, top to bottom. Getting back into it, Callie and her boyfriend Kyle watched the infamous Johnny Bananas backpack episode of The Real World Road Rules. Well over a decade, this clip just keeps popping up, but Callie knows Shauna did something to Adam because of the news story at the end of season one. But the shocker to her is that Jeff, her father, knows, and seemingly everything is sunshine and rainbows between the couple, which is starting a rift between them and Callie. Back to the wilderness, we get a glimpse of what Shauna is up to, hanging out in the meat locker with Jackie. Hold up, hold up. This frigid friend is still alive. Oh, no, no. She, she's dead. Never mind. Shauna is having severe hallucinations and denial, seemingly hanging out with Jackie like nothing has happened. So we can assume that exposure and hunger is ramping up the hallucinations this season. The two play the childhood game of M.A.S.H., determining one another's futures, which surprisingly almost picks everything that Shauna actually has when she's an adult. Aside from the million dollars and rabbit pet, this could actually refer to the rabbit that she killed and then cooked and fed her family. We learn it's been two months since Jackie has passed, so Shauna is not taking it well. Three new girls are finally introduced, probably being the sacrificial meat this season. 
But I just have to kind of laugh because, like, where were they the entire first season? But, like, now they're here. I'm nitpicking, but Crystal is one of them being a theater kid, singing and humming, but getting on everyone's nerves. I wasn't singing, I was humming. Cool. Stop. Back in the meat shed, which was my college dorm room name, we learn more about Jeff and Shauna and how their relationship started. It basically started with lies. She thought Jackie and Jeff were on the relationship rocks, but in reality, Jeff was going to leave Jackie because she just wasn't putting out for him. So the Shauna and Jeff situation started on false pretenses, which makes everything a bit more muddy from everyone's point of view. Shauna, upset about her own thoughts, shoves Jackie, breaking off her ear, frantically trying to fix it, instead picking it up and placing it in her pocket. Now this could be setting up the end of this episode, but an ear spiritually signifies the reception of truth, Shauna learning the true story from Jackie. She returns to the other, stating that she had to cut back on rations once again because food is running dangerously low, and uh, stick around because I think I know the solution here. Tasia winning the state senate campaign last season is far from in the clear because Simone, her wife, is pissed off about the basement altar, even though Tasia hasn't a clue what she's talking about. This was done because of her sleepwalking and dirt eating, which by the way is probably pika, an eating disorder in which people eat things that usually are not considered food, brought upon by stress and other factors. She tried to surprise their son with a new pooch named Steve, but she's not permitting Tasia to see him until she steps down from office and gets some help. So almost another blackmailing situation here with her own family, threatening to go to the presses if it isn't fixed. Seems awfully suspicious for a setup of Simone going bye-bye and Tasia covering it up. But later she does discover what she did in the basement and is hella emotional about their old dog, Biscuit, and the potential danger she was putting her family in. So she may actually seek help because of the overwhelming campaign and new political position. We find out Natalie and Travis had been going on daily hunt trips almost regularly, returning without any game, resulting in a cutback of the rations. But while out hunting, they've been venturing in completely different directions, therefore creating and mapping out a seven mile radius around the cabin. One thing jumped out to me when looking at this makeshift map, but this looks to be the same hollow tree stump that Lottie had sacrificed the bear heart to at the end of season one. And it looks like it might say gathering spot next to it. I could be wrong. Maybe everyone knows about the weird Lottie rituals at the end of season one. Or maybe that hasn't happened yet. This actually was a time jump, so we'll, we'll see. The other reason the two have been venturing out so much is to find Javi. Travis's younger brother ran off the night of Doom's coming, which was roughly two months ago, and they haven't seen a glimpse or any evidence of his fate. It's a total mystery at this point. The hallucinations, probably due to starvation, continue with Travis believing that a dead fox is a dead hobby, with Natalie quickly shaking him back to his senses. Natalie marks the area with a small piece of fabric to denote which areas they've already explored. Now, I have a feeling that this could come back at some point, or could even be the meaning for the weird symbols in the forest. Like, the symbols are the equivalent of Natalie leaving fabric behind, Maybe the mysterious cabin man from the end of season one was using them as guide signs. Misty was right about them missing something beyond Adam's credit card statements because Shauna remembers Adam had a mysterious art studio that could contain something incriminating. Her and Jeff saunter over there to discover dozens of paintings of Shauna, taking a note from Jack Dawson's book, despite her never posing for him. Obviously, this is a weird predicament for Jeff, but full-on turns into a kink-filled passion party pervert fest as the two make some Jackson Pollock paintings of their own. Now, there is this hella creepy skull-looking painting that's featured a couple of times. It's not connected with anything supernatural from the wilderness 25 years ago, but I think it's Adam's interpretation of Shauna having a darker side to her. All of the other paintings are solely based on her beauty, while this is sinister looking. 
Back in season one, we learn that Adam started doing his own research on Shauna, the Yellow Jackets, the crash, everything, making me think that he came to the conclusion that there might be a darker side to her, and this is unveiling the mask to see her true colors. The pair destroy the paintings with turpentine, rinse their hands of the situation, hopefully. Misty is on the hunt for Natalie, visiting the scummy motel for answers. Misty again continues to be my favorite character, solely based on the unhinged nature of her bright and bubbly but sinister personality, threatening the hotel manager with all of his personal information. This freaks him out, despite stonewalling her, revealing Natalie, yes, had paid in cash and left in the middle of the evening, which is half true. Citizen Detective Misty discovers the door appears to have been kicked in and there was a security camera facing the door. So I'm thinking next episode, she will know exactly who took Natalie. Even though Jeff got down with Shauna's sensual painting session, he is a bit torn on the whole situation, aggressively rocking out to Papa Roach's last resort, thinking he may be Shauna's last hope, or that this is the final straw, because the creepy painting once again makes an appearance here, meaning Jeff may be seeing Shauna for who she actually is for once. Jeff being rattled is also witnessed at the dinner table when he is unable to come up with a joke, whereas earlier it was no problem. How do you get an art major off your front porch? What? You pay for the pizza. What'd the bun say to the hot dog? <laughs> Damn. Got yeah, nothing. The pair burn Adam's license and Shauna's diaries, disaster averted. Well, may maybe. Back in the wilderness, Natalie tries to reason with Travis about Javi, which results in him having a panic attack. I believe that this is in fact solely a panic attack, and Lottie is able to soothe him back into relaxing, similarly to the patient in the opening sequence. However, with him having visions of the stump heart sacrifice altar, screams Lottie may actually have some sort of supernatural power over the others. Maybe Travis didn't actually see this, and the viewers, us as viewers, are the only ones meant to. Either way, I think Lottie is only half right about her visions, telling Travis Javi is alive, even though this is unknown. She's trying to use hope to keep him going, so this Lottie and the Lottie of the future could honestly be hacks and delusional for their own faux powers. Natalie, though, is on to her, which leads into present day and her being kidnapped. We finally see who kidnapped her, and yes, the inkling suspicion was Lottie's cult, and that proves to be true, as a young recruit, dressed in the same purple coloring, and sporting a similar pendant with the symbol from the wilderness. Above the bed is a sign stating breathe, which we've seen, you know, used a couple times on Travis and the patient in the opening. Natalie, though, stabs the recruit with a fork, escapes, and learns she's at a place called Camp Green Pine, which seems to be the same location Lottie was giving her speech in the opening, with several other purple-clad people chasing her down. Natalie stumbles into a midsummer-like ceremony Lottie and the others are partaking in, wearing animal masks referring back to the wilderness and our primal state, essentially burying someone. I want to say that this symbolizes them shedding their old self and being born again, tying in with Lottie's speech in the opening. Natalie is ready to smash in Lottie's brains, but stops her saying that she has a message from Travis, which causes her to freeze in her actions. Now I'm saying that she may have a message because of her involvement with emptying Travis's bank accounts after his death, but I also see this as false hope, the same potential false hope she gave to Travis in the wilderness about Javi. Lottie knows exactly what she's doing. She's amassed all of these followers because of the same promise of hope. The ending of the episode sort of has a three-part story playing out, one of which is Callie finally having her suspicions of her mother and Adam being confirmed that they are responsible for his disappearance because of a burnt piece of his license is found in the grill. Huge rift between the parents and offspring this season just wait. Natalie and Travis, on the other hand, following their usual routes, going out searching, come across a dead tree, but it looks like the base and moss around it is unaffected by the harsh cold. 
To me, this looks similar to where Lottie sacrificed the bear heart at the end of season one, but this is more of a tree than a stump, maybe whatever sacrifice is causing this to actually grow once again. Now, this moss also shows up in the opening on the cabin, so maybe whatever Lottie sacrifices to is keeping them safe, or the evil from it is slowly creeping into the rest of them. Lastly, the episode comes to a close on the grand daddy of all setups, Shauna is the first to eat human flesh. She had kept Jackie's discarded ear in her pocket throughout this whole episode, longingly looking at it a couple of times. It could be said she was doing this because she was missing her friend, but rather, I think she was weighing the options on whether or not to eat it, which she does at the end, setting us on a path of full-on cannibalistic coalition. No doubt Shauna is going to be the one that leads them all to eating human flesh. With her divvying out the rations, Jackie is slowly but surely going to become a menu item for the rest of the girls. It's, it's right there. So I wonder if this divide we see in the intro draws its origins back to this event, with some doing anything and everything to survive, while others refuse these practices. This has got to be why showrunner Ashley Lyle has called season two the winter of their discontent. It's also crazy that this episode is titled Friends, Romans, and Countrymen, coming from the opening line of a William Shakespeare monologue, or Billy Shakes for all you cool kids out there. And the next few words of this monologue are Lend Me Your Ears, a.k.a. Jackie's Ear. <gasps> Another thing I picked up on was Natalie's relationship with Lottie and her cult. Obviously, last season, Natalie was kidnapped by them, and the recruit of this episode says, We were scared you may hurt yourself. This insinuates they know of Natalie's destructive behavior. Well... I think it's because the rehab center Natalie graduated from in episode one of season one is owned by Lottie. Or maybe rehabilitation is actually what this quote cult is. The reason I say this is because of the color of the clothing worn. Lottie, the one in charge, is wearing orange in the opening with the others wearing purple. In Natalie's rehab, she is wearing purple while the counselor is wearing a similar orange. Lottie didn't want Natalie to relapse, so this is why she was kidnapped, but I think that there might be more to this. Anyway, that is episode one of season two, ending this latest Yellow Jackets on a big ew. Honestly, I, I think this is a great start to this season, building upon all of the scrambles the characters are in while introducing more survivors we didn't know about in season one. My biggest question, though, is whether or not supernatural elements are actually at play here. A lot of the stuff can be explained away via hallucinations and science, so I hope that they continue to toe this line. But what are your thoughts on Season 2 so far, and what sort of theories do you have brewing about anything and everything? I'd love to hear them in the comments. And I'll let you know, we're currently running a competition, giving away three copies of the Superman collection on the 15th of April. And all you gotta do to get a chance of winning this is like this video, subscribe with notifications on, and drop your thoughts on episode one of Yellow Jackets. We pick the comments at random at the end of every single month, and the winners of last month are on screen right now. So if that's you, message us on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, be sure to check out some of our other videos right over there great throwback breakdowns we've been doing but with all of that out of the way thank you for your constant support this is episode one we're gonna be breaking all of these down i've been jared i'll see you in the next one take care and peace